This week sees the resumption of the Extinction Rebellion actions in London and elsewhere. One of their three demands is that the government should hand over its power to a citizens' assembly. Would this be, as the group claims, a move to better democracy? Or would it instead be a Trojan horse to push the exact opposite? Let's discuss. My name's Malin Baker. This is the Malin Baker Show for Changemakers. I recently started reading the biographies of US presidents. And through the lives of the first three, the ones who were at the founding of the nation, you get a constant concern with the question of how to design the constitution of a country that would lead to good governance. Good governance has to be able to survive individual bad leaders. That's just one of those lessons from history. And it has to be able to keep great leaders, the Napoleons, from being given license to become despots. The US Constitution, like the British unwritten constitution that evolved with the disempowering of the monarchy, established certain principles to achieve that end. Separate the executive branch from the legislative branch. Have a reviewing or revising chamber to review the details and ensure the rule of law applies to the government by having an independent judiciary. The people directly elect the government, so the government is able to be held to account. On a day-to-day -day basis, the executive is held to account by the elected chamber and kept within the law by the judges. The activities of the government are executed by an independent civil service so that the machinery of government can build ongoing expertise that only comes with deep knowledge and experience. The revising chamber is there to ensure the details scrutinised by people with a lot of experience. Now, in the UK, that's for House of Lords, but because it isn't elected and therefore isn't accountable, ultimately it's only allowed to challenge. The elected chamber is supreme. To date, it has been the most successful model of governance that we have in terms of its longevity and its association with countries that have been successful entities in the world. And, of course, its democratic legitimacy. According to Extinction Rebellion, it's not good enough. It now needs to be replaced by, or at least, very least, made subservient to, this thing called a citizens' assembly. What is a citizens' assembly? A group of people, maybe a hundred, selected at random, but with some sort of process to make that group representative of a variety of demographic factors. This group then receives expert inputs on a topic, deliberates and comes back with a solution. You might ask yourself why a campaign on climate change is demanding a change to how the country is governed rather than demanding practical changes to reduce our carbon emissions. Well, in previous videos we've covered the fact that the founders of Extinction Rebellion are political activists of the left who see exile's function to bring down the government. This isn't, I would suggest, why the vast majority of people get involved with the group. They do it because they're good people who are concerned about climate change. Some of them may have become radicalised by XR's overclaiming of the science and framing what needs to be done, for sure, but by no means the majority. Although it's always been there, hiding in plain sight in his third demand, not everyone has really taken on what the implications are. So, what's the argument for a citizens' assembly of the sort that XR wants? And we have to draw a distinction between what others have tried and what XR wants. Other citizens' assemblies, such as the one in Ireland that's often quoted as having been successful, have been advisory. Governments will punt a problem over to them and then make a decision whether or not to implement the recommendations that come back. On that basis, there's no argument to be put against them, really, but that's not what we're talking about here. In his recent pamphlet, XR founder Roger Hallam talks about the role of citizens' assemblies as being the chief democratic vehicle after the rebellion has been successful and the government has been brought to heel. The current government hands power to an administration which will call a national climate and ecological emergency and immediately enact measures to deal with the climate and ecological crisis. The citizens' assembly, says Hallam, is... Deeply democratic and popular, brackets, involves ordinary people, so that no Democrat or Liberal can object to it. I object to it because I'm a Democrat. 
as opposed to the proposition that a revolutionary left-wing elite removes democratic processes in a bid to create a socialist society, brackets, been there and done that. Well, yes, I'm not a fan of the revolutionary left-wing coup either. I'm thinking there might be a third option in this slightly stacked either-or deck. Hallam's convinced that all you need to do is feed this random group of people with the right information and they'll come up with the goods. And for good reason, we can predict that the outcomes of assemblies will be far more progressive and rational than conventional cynical commentators would predict. No, we don't want the rich and powerful robbing us of the fruits of our labour. And no, we don't want our children to die in a climate catastrophe. Thank you very much. These revolutionary types find it completely impossible to imagine that a cross-section of ordinary people may not see the world through the same mindset as they do. Hallam says that the Citizens' Assembly will make better decisions than traditional government because the current way has decisions being made by politicians who are under the influence of a barrage of lobbyists and careerist considerations, both of which take them away from the simple matter of making an educated choice that is aimed at the best outcome for all. So the claimed benefit in that case is that it will make better decisions because its members will be free from the influence of lobbyists. Well, we do know quite a bit about what makes for good decision making, particularly being consultative with stakeholders to the decision. In other words, if a proposed decision is going to affect you in a significant way, the people making the decision should give you a chance to make your input. Effective decisions are made in good knowledge of the likely consequences. And you should hear as much from the people who think that decision would be a terrible thing as you do from those who support it. This, of course, is why authoritarian regimes often make bad decisions. If passing on a negative opinion or bad news about the consequences of the dear leader's policies might get you killed, then you're not going to do it. Without any kind of pushback on proposed decisions or timely feedback as to the consequences, then you get outcomes like, for instance, the draining of the Aral Sea. In parliamentary democracy, the fact that there is lobbying is an essential part of what makes for good decision making. The government publishes a green paper with its ideas and invites everyone with a view to make that view known. Obviously, what people fear is that corporations use their resources to buy unequal access to decision makers. And that's why we have a number of checks and balances built in. But where decisions affect companies, their voices should be heard. After all, those companies create jobs that employ millions of people. And many of them are actually further ahead on looking at decarbonising their processes than anyone else. And it's not just companies that lobby governments. Trade unions, campaigning NGOs, charitable organisations, all of them have made use of the right to be heard when legislation is considered. Now, there's no guaranteed mechanism for that with this vision of citizens' assemblies. So the proposition is that a random group of people handed information about an issue will come up with better decisions than a draft paper that invites comments from all invited parties, a minister who will meet with many of the interested parties, backed up by a system of parliamentary committees that pull in people to give evidence. That is, to say the least, an unproven contention. Now, of course, the supporters point to the Citizens' Assembly in Ireland in 2016 as the proof that it works. That assembly considered a number of different topics, but of course became famous for considering the issue of abortion. Roger Hallam describes it glowingly thus. The Citizens' Assembly in Ireland in 2016 is a good example where an issue that could have destroyed a political career was taken on and deliberated over 99 randomly chosen citizens to great effect and succeeded in repealing an archaic law that demonised women and took away their right to make decisions about their own bodies. Now, in that passage, Roger is basically saying the Assembly came, in his opinion, to the correct decision, and therefore that's a fine example. Of course, the Ireland Citizens' Assembly was advisory. It didn't have central decision-making powers, as Roger would wish. The point of democratic governance is that it should retain legitimacy even when it comes up with a decision you disagree with. Because there are times when you lose the debate, and you accept that's what happens in a democracy. 
using the fact that something came up with a decision you agree with is no argument for a bad process. This passage also introduces his other argument in relation to the quality of decision making by the Assembly, which is that, in his view, it can be bolder in proposing things because the politicians would be wary of signing up to things that would be unpopular with their constituents. He amplifies this point. In the case of climate breakdown and how society is going to avoid the worst effects of it, citizens' assemblies, chosen by sortition, are our only democratic hope. The transition that will be shown to be necessary would be political death for any one party should they suggest the changes that will be required. Now, here Rogers admitting that the programme he believes to be desirable would not be supported by the electorate and therefore such policies will need to be imposed. And his optimistic view is that people would accept such imposition if a Citizens' Assembly had decided on it because, after all, these are ordinary people like me. Well, it's not necessarily the case. In addition to the proposal on abortion, the Island Assembly also recommended reducing the minimum age for candidates for president, a proposal which was rejected in a referendum by the population as a whole. And that was a proposal that didn't affect the population directly, such as rationing people's electricity use or flying, measures that Hallam has suggested should be implemented. Groups opposed to abortion protested and criticised the Citizens' Assembly as a sham consultation exercise. And I think if such a group put forward Roger Hallam's radical programme, there would be plenty more similar groups on the streets. So now we get to the heart of it. The reason why MPs won't support things the electorate can't be persuaded to support is because they're held accountable. That's the nature of democracy. To whom is the Assembly accountable? We randomly select these people from the population to serve for a limited time. If they don't take it seriously, or simply fail to come up with the goods, what happens? The Ireland Assembly only had an average of 26 out of the 99 people attending its meetings. So even if a wider pool of people was selected to be representative, it seems the ones who did most of the work were a much smaller group and possibly not representative at all as a result. Not a problem for a consultative exercise. Huge problem for a replacement for democratic government. Now come to that, what's not clear from Hallam's description of his post-revolutionary transition is this. Who chooses which experts the Assembly hears from? There's huge power in that role. Not mentioned. What has happened to the executive branch of government in all this? If Citizens' Assembly has now taken over from the legislative branch of government, who is fulfilling the role of the actual government? Not mentioned. If you have a group that has brought the current regime down on the basis of its firm belief that a programme needs to be put in place that won't be supported by the people, do we think that when the Citizens' Assembly comes back with an insufficiently radical programme, they're going to shrug their shoulders and say, ugh, well, it was worth a try. Because what Roger doesn't mention is that the Ireland Citizens' Assembly also considered climate change. They didn't come up with a huge radical plan to shut down the economy to get to zero carbon by 2025. They came up instead with a bunch of relatively modest proposals that would all be nice to do's but wouldn't collectively on their own solve the problem. Why did they not deliver the sort of outcome Roger would hope for? Probably because they got input from experts on climate change but not people pushing the apocalyptic vision that Roger believes to be the truth. So it's not just about informing this panel, it's also propagandising for the preferred solutions on the part of people who are so deeply into their worldview they can't tell the difference. It ought to be obvious by now that rather than being a better sort of democracy, this is actually the sort of tool that supports authoritarian rule. The logic of what's written is that you have decision making without accountability, informed by processes undisclosed, executed by powers unnamed. Only people who are either deeply cynical or completely unknowledgeable about what constitutes good governance would think that such a proposal counts as democracy. Or indeed, that it should be one of the central planks of a campaign on the issue of climate change. There's no reason why a consultative citizen assembly couldn't be a helpful thing to implement to help inform decision making 
on difficult areas. But let's be clear, that isn't why it's part of the Extinction Rebellion platform. There's certainly a good argument for saying public demonstrations and protests to push government to fulfil its commitments for net zero by 2050 would be a helpful thing to do. Not with a polarising approach of Extinction Rebellion, maybe, but it's not helpful that this gets framed around an attempt to replace mature systems of government with a replacement that's never been tried successfully anywhere and lacks so many of the basics of what would make for good or democratically legitimate governance. Mm -hmm.